Thanks, Clive. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction. I'm going to assume that everybody can hear me. Is that correct? Okay, excellent. So, um, as introduced, um, I'm an assistant professor in material science and engineering, uh, also uh, associate director for the Center of 2D uh, and Layered Materials, which Mauricio and the next speaker will, will introduce in a much more comprehensive uh, manner. And I want to talk about um, some work that we've been doing over the last couple of years um, on epitaxial graphene and why we, um, you know, my group, is, uh, has, has some affection for this material. So a little bit of background, uh, or the outline, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of background about, uh, on graphene. Uh, Nitten, even with his technical um, uh, issues, did a, a nice um, overview of some of the, uh, the band structure in, in, in graphene, uh, as well as, as topological insulators. And then I'll, I'll, I'll really delve into epitaxial graphene and this, this particular flavor of graphene that uh, has a lot of very rich material science as well as electrical engineering um, uh, aspects to it. And this is just a, a quick number of publications as a function of year, uh, and you can see these are carbon nanotubes on the order of seven to 8,000 publications a year for nanotubes. Graphene is not far behind following its, its, its uh, quote, discovery uh, in 2004. We're up to about 3,000 uh, publications a year. So, so it's a very, very hot field. So what is graphene? Uh, graphene uh, is considered the mother of all graphites. I like this slide. I put it up there on every single one of my talks. Uh, it is a two-dimensional array of carbon atoms bonded uh, sp2 hybridized carbon atoms. It can be stacked to form graphite. It can be rolled up uh, to form carbon nanotubes. And it can be balled up to form uh, buckyball. So, so this two-dimensional material gives rise to three dimensions, one dimension, and zero dimensions. And in 2000 or sorry, in 2010, the Nobel Prize was uh, presented to Andre Gein and Konstantin Novoselov uh, for groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. And this is their paper that was published in 2004, Electric Field Effect in Atomically Thin Carbon Films. It's now been cited 13,252 times as of last week, uh, so, so, which is you know, the average of most material science professors here in, at Penn State, right? So, but with like any, any uh, celebrity uh, in Hollywood, graphene also has its controversies. Uh, and and uh, after, after the award, or in the process of when the award was being given, uh, there was, uh, uh, the, the Nobel Prize came under fire. Uh, and there were, there's a series of articles in Nature that kind of, uh, kind of discuss this. So this is where I introduce Professor Walt DeHere from Georgia Tech, who's been uh, credited for the discovery of epitaxial graphene, the graphene that, that I'm, I'm fond of. And he went through a series of, of articles explaining the, uh, what, what he refers to as the true history of graphene, uh, and, and basically stated that the Nobel Prize Committee did not do its homework. Uh, and uh, this all made for very good reading uh, for us uh, gra graphene scientists, uh, very juicy stuff. Guy came back and said, well, if he complains about it, he's just, he's just trying to tell the world that maybe he did something important. Uh, and uh, through a series of articles, uh, Deheer presented uh, you know, his arguments. Uh, in physics script, Deheer's one, invention of graphene electronics and the physics of epitaxial graphene, uh, which provided that uh, he, graphene electronics were officially invented in 2003 uh, so a year and a half before for the, uh, the first publication. And this was conceived in 2001, a full four and a half years before uh, the, uh, the, this seminal paper by Gaiman and Bosilev. But what's more important to me um, as, as part of my research is, is in these same arguments, he's, he's laying out this case uh, for the most promising direction in graphene electronics is epitaxial graphene. Uh, and, and he lays out a series of of, of reasons why he believes epitaxial graphene is, is the, uh, the lead in this. So, so what is it about graphene that is causing our, quote, graphene celebrities to argue amongst themselves uh, as to, uh, to, to who gets claim to what? Uh, and as it turns out, as Nitten pointed out, there's uh, linear, band, uh, <laughs> linear uh, dispersion in the bands for the conduction band and the valence band. This gives rise to some very interesting properties, uh, electronic properties in the material. 
There's no band gap, uh, and this linear band structure provides uh, very high electron mobility. The no band gap provides for ambipolar conduction, uh, which now we can, we can very easily sweep uh, between uh, electron uh, and pole conduction uh, in graphene, which is, is, is pretty unique for, for these various materials. And in the form of, of graphene electronics, what we find is electron mobility versus band gap here, we see that uh, this linear band structure, which gives rise to uh, uh, Dirac fermions, uh, provides for extraordinarily high electron mobility in uh, this material system compared to all other semiconductor materials. And just as importantly as the electron velocity, it's much higher uh, than, than that of any other semiconductor material. So, so if we start thinking about nanoscale devices, which take advantage of electron velocity, we can now start making devices that are faster than any other, any other uh, uh, semiconductor can provide. On the other hand, uh, <clears throat> from a mechanical engineering point of view, it's also the strongest material. And uh, the quote that comes out of uh, the Nobel Prize uh, publication uh, is that it's so strong that a one meter squared hammock, no heavier than a cat's whisker, can bear the weight of an average sized cat without breaking. So those of you that are entrepreneurs uh, in mechanical engineering, uh, you can also think of, of doing some, some uh, feline luxury if you would like. Uh, and interestingly enough, these really are in the Nobel Prize document. So, but, but I'm most interested in the electronic properties of graphene. What does graphene offer us uh, in, in terms of applications? And there's a whole host of, of potential applications that, that come from uh, the, the, the properties of graphene. As uh, you can see here, touch screens, electronic payment, thermal management, optoelectronics. There's, again, a, a very large variety. And this is why there's been so many publications, so much interest in graphene, because the... Uh, the, uh, the floodgates really are open in terms of, of, of applications. So, so this really brings me into the, the, the bulk of the, the, the discussion, which is how do we succeed in graphene electronics from a material science point of view and uh, the interface between material science and electrical engineering. So I'm showing here just a general process by which we go through our synthesis all the way through uh, device fabrication. and. The very first thing that we have to succeed at is, is growing very high quality graphene. In my case, it's epitaxiographene, my specific flavor. There's also chemical vapor, chemical vapor deposition um, uh, is a process, uh, as well as mechanical exfoliation, which is excellent for Nobel Prizes. Uh, and, and then there's some other chemical uh, processes to form graphene. The next step really is integrating graphene with metals uh, and, and to to start making a transistor, a graphene-based transistor. And this is followed by integrating graphene with dielectrics. So we, now we have graphene. Uh, it's not just good enough by itself. We have to be able to do something with it. So if we need metals, we need dielectrics. And each one of these offer uh, a, a very rich space for material science uh, and engineering. And then the final is, is a little more electrical engineering, which is, is designing the devices and scaling the, uh, the transistors such that we can get high frequency performance out of these, out of these systems. So again, epitaxiographene, how do we synthesize it? Uh, what was first, you know, as I mentioned previously, Professor De here at Georgia Tech uh, discovered uh, graphene uh, as apparently as early as 2001. It's based on the removing of silicon from a silicon carbide substrate. Uh, so what we have here is our silicon and our carbon uh, in carbon in yellow. As we heat this silicon carbide wafer up uh, at 12 to 1300 Celsius, uh, we find that we get a six root three carbon reconstruction. Uh, little time passes and uh, we start desorbing uh, silicon from the edge of this reconstruction. And then ultimately what happens is this continues. We get bond breaking and rearrangement. And then we find that uh, the formation of graphene, it's almost as if there's an unzipping of this, this process underneath the, uh, this uh, buffer layer. So this is, this is known as a buffer layer. And then we have our single layer of graphene on the surface. Um, you know, it's, it, it is highly scalable, but it does require very high temperatures um, above 13, 1400 Celsius. So what's it look like? Uh, 
in an epitaxial graphene, uh, we have a silicon carbide wafer. So these are four inch wafers. It's a wide band gap semiconductor material. It typically has steps or terraces in the surface. And this is an atomic force uh, micrograph of, of those terraces. And if we grow graphene in ultra high vacuum, uh, what we find is that we get a very non-uniform surface. So this is AFM, and this is known as lean low energy electron microscopy, where we can directly see what the layer thickness is. And the reason that we get very non-uniform growth uh, in the system is because the silicon uh, uh, comes off incongruently. It, it sublimes incongruently. So we have a, really, there's no control over the silicon desorption out of this, out of this system. So if you move to a low pressure growth, so now we've got argon in the system or nitrogen. Some, uh, 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 some have done use helium as well. Uh, what we, we quickly find is that we're able to get back to this step structure uh, similar to what's in the silica carbide uh, surface when we buy the wafer. Uh, and in fact, we can get very smooth growths on the terraces. Uh, uh, these, are, these are terraces and these are the, known as the, or referred to as the step edge. Uh, in, in the process. So, so this is really what we want in terms of high performance electronics. We want uniform material. Now you'll notice that, that in this particular case there is variation in the, in the, in the synthesis uh, or in the, uh, the uniformity of this system. So we want to better understand, okay, why, why is it that we're seeing this? Uh, so a few years ago we went uh, and we, we looked at the nucleation of epitaxial graphene because we have to understand graphene, the synthesis from the very basic parameters so that we can then take that, uh, optimize it, uh, and, and develop it into this vertically integrated um, approach for, for uh, graphene electronics. And I'm showing up here three different samples uh, for AFM. And <clears throat> what we then do is we go through a process where we just uh, nucleate the graphene. Uh, there's, a, there's a series of experiments that you can do where you can control the graphene synthesis such that it, it nucleates and then stops. And when we do that, what we find in Raman spectroscopy is we get these stripes. And where these stripes are in Raman, these mapping, is where the graphene is. So we're seeing that, uh, and, and uh, nicely enough, they correlate very well with the step edges on the surface here. So Raman's telling us that the nucleation is occurring on the step edges. This is just the Raman spectra. Graphene's here and here, and in the purple, there is no graphene. So we take this one step further, and we look at transmission electron microscopy, cross-sectional PEM. And in fact, using these processes, which are uh, relatively low temperature growth, actually, um, for, for this system, uh, uh, the, we're able to grow multi-layer graphene just on the step edge itself and no graphene can form on the terrace. So, so TEM confirms what we believed, uh, or we, we found in Raman. Um, and interestingly enough, the quality of the terrace really dictates the quality of the epitaxial graphene. So, so we know that, that epitaxial graphene, the graphene that we have coming off of silicon carbide, uh, requires these step edges to grow because they form at the step edge and then it laterally grows um, across the, the step itself and this is by this little, little character uh, that, that you see here. So, so you know, the title of this slide really is you know, early indications that it's a necessary evil. So we absolutely have to have it for the growth. Um, if it doesn't grow on these step edges, it'll actually, you can find growth out in the middle but it's related to defects in the silicon carbide surface. We do Hall crosses, so this is, provides us with a means to um, pull out some of the electronic properties. The carrier uh, mobility is where, well, as is, is doping of the, of the system. We have our only contacts here, silicon carbide on here, and it wetched away, etched away this uh, graphene cross. Whenever we have uh, silicon carbide substrates that are very close to what's known as on-axis, so this is the C-axis, uh, it, plane in the, in the system is perpendicular here. It's the 0001 plane of the silicon carbide. What we find is in Raman spectroscopy, we get these meandering steps. So this is multi-layer graphene. This is correlated very well with the steps and single-layer graphene. Uh, and we, we do a, a bunch of these Hall crosses, and the properties are all over the place for a carrier mobility versus carrier concentration. Significant ranges in doping um, and in carrier mobility. Uh, <coughs> But as soon as we go a little bit off axis, so we take this wafer and we just kind of tilt it a little bit, 
polish it such that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, as little as 0.2 degrees off of this plane, we get very parallel steps, uh, very parallel terraces. Uh, there's multi-layer graphene, as you can see here, and single-layer graphene here. Uh, and and our, our data becomes much more uniform uh, in this sense. So we know here now that, that the step edges, while we have to have them for nucleating the graphene, they can cause an impact in the transport properties or the, the, the ability to, to have very high mobility in the system. In addition to that, we notice that you know, there's, there's a, almost a limit to the, uh, the, the care mobility here of, of only 1,000 centimeters squared per volt second. So we wanted to better understand two things. One is what's going on with this buffer layer uh, because in silicon carbide we have this buffer layer then we have our graphene and the next is, is really <coughs> what's the importance of the steps uh, on it because we clearly can see that it does degrade the, uh, the, the carrier mobility in the system. So the first thing that we did was we really looked at uh, decoupling our graphene from our silicon carbide. And this was done um, about nine months before we started um, on, the, on the process in, in Germany, uh, where, where there was, we have our silicon carbide here, uh, and you, if you are very careful, you can grow just this buffer layer. So it's partially covalently bound. Here's our six root, re, uh, root three reconstruction. And then you can also grow one monolayer, which has this buffer layer in between as well. You do what's known as hydrogen intercalation of the epitaxial graphene. So now we've We've, we've been able to stuff hydrogen in between there, and this is just done by introducing uh, epitaxial graphene uh, at, at about 900 to 1,000 C in hydrogen. And the hydrogen intercalates in between uh, this, the, uh, the, the, the partially covalently bound layer here, forms a second layer of graphene if you have one, um, or just one monolayer. <coughs> and this can easily be seen in ARPAS, angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy, which is what Nitten had, was, had been discussing for the topological insulators, where we start off with our, uh, just a, with a buffer layer across the top. There's, there is no band structure for the system. And once we do the hydrogenation, so now we have this and we get, we can see the valence band. So this is, again, this is this linear uh, band structure. Uh, it is p-doped. Uh, because here's the Fermi level and the top of this is actually um, above it. The conduction band is up here. If we then heat it, we can come back to nothing. So we're able to absorb the hydrogen out of there at high temperature. You have to get back up to 900 C or so. And it's the same with, with monolayer graphene and bilayer graphene. Monolayer, here's our Dirac, uh, Dirac cone. Um, you get two layers, so now you see two curves. Uh, and you're able to get back to one um, after heating it at high temperature. We can also follow this in Raman spectroscopy. <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the peak properties, uh, or the, the, the characterization of the, the, the peaks here, can give us an indication of the quality of this hydrogenation process. And we can see it in XPS as well, um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, where we have um, as grown epitaxial graphene. We have graphene, silicon carbide, but we also have this buffer layer, this S1 and S2 region. Uh, which is, is uh, uh, very indicative of having this buffer layer here. You do the hydrogenation process uh, and you end up getting completely rid of, of these, these peaks here, which indicates to us that we've properly done the hydrogenation. So now we know from a materials point of view that we're able to decouple this graphene from the silicon carbide. We get what's known as quasi-freestanding epitaxial graphene, but we really uh, we need to understand how does this impact the electronic properties of graphene uh, as well in this particular material system. So when we do that, and we, look, we take a look back at our carrier mobility versus carrier density, and here's our astron, so we still have our buffer layer here. We just partially hydrogenate it. So we, we just, we break some bonds, we don't break them all, we get this large change in, in uh, uh, carrier density and degradation of mobility. And this is, 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 again, akin to not being able to fully unzip all of these bonds, a uh, significant amount of doping. But then we take it and we do the full hydrogenation. We're able to passivate and fully separate the graphene from the silicon carbide. And at that point, uh, what we find is we get a 2 to 3x improvement in our, our care mobility as well as, as, as our uh, uh, carrier concentration. And, and it turns to p-type at this point. Um, but we still have a lot of spread in the data here. So where's this spread coming from? Uh, so you take a look at, at uh, 
separating this as a function of step edge density. So now we, we, we take another look back, we go back to our hall crosses, we do Raman on them, and we say, okay, there's just one or two step, step edges going through uh, our hall cross here uh, versus, versus a, a large density. And in fact, what we find very clearly is that the high density of steps, the more steps that go through these hall crosses, the lower the carrier mobility. Uh, and, and if once we go to and we reduce these steps, we're able to improve our, our average mobility by 2x simply by avoiding these steps. So, so why is that? What is going on? What is it about these steps that, that can, can reduce the, uh, the properties of the, or the, the, the quality of our epitaxial graphene from an electronic standpoint? So we do some, so we have various scattering models um, that, are, that are pulled in. And we find, you know, looking at phonon scattering and, and impurity scattering, <coughs> and we, we, we look at the carrier mobility as a function of temperature um, in this system. And from this, we can see that we can extract the remote impurity concentration, but also a, a coupling factor, uh, which tells us how strongly bound the epitaxial graphene is to the substrate. Looking at the <coughs> Hall mobility as a function of temperature, we're able to model that using those previous equations I just showed uh, so that we can pull out the impact of, of impurity scattering versus phonon scattering. And we see for as grown epitaxial graphene, so we've got this buffer layer now and we, we, we have our, our graphene layer, uh, there's, there's a significant amount of impurity scattering and this is because it's temperature independent. Uh, phonon scattering is temperature dependent, so we can see this. When we do the hydrogenation process, it reduces the impurity scattering, uh, and, and we still have, in both of these cases, a high step density. Um, sorry, high step density. Uh, so, so we know the hydrogenation process separating the graphene from the silicon carbide, we can improve our transport, and it's by, as, as a result of reducing the impurities. Uh, so, the, so this buffer layer is a source of impurity scattering. If we then reduce the number of steps in our hall cross, so in our, in our material, and we say, okay, now we've gone from something that's got a bunch of these steps in them to something that has almost none, we double our, our uh, carrier mobility. We still see that there's, there's a significant amount of impurity scattering, which is, is this temperature independent regime. But we also see, if you take a look at, at the, the right side there, that there is a, there is a reduction in this bending, this temperature dependent. Uh, uh, region. So this tells us that the step edges are really a source of increased surface optical phonon scattering, so that's SOP uh, here. So we have to be very careful about understanding uh, and, and play, taking this into, into account in our graphene electronics. On the other hand, uh, we can make lemonade out of lemons. Um, so if we take, we, we, we see, you know, just show this back up where we have all these stripes here have not grown any graphene on, on these edges, we can now think about possibly engineering it such that we have graphene nanoribbons, bottom-up graphene nanoribbons on the silicon carbide, where we have uh, these facets, these edges, we grow graphene, and then we just put devices on top of that. And that's something that was being done in parallel to uh, De Heer's group, um, who published this in, in uh, nanotechnology, nature nanotechnology, to show that, in fact, if you etch a mesa, uh, that's what they did here, etch a nice square mesa, you can grow graphene just along that mesa, and then you can make devices out of it. So this really is uh, the, the making lemonades out of, uh, lemonade out of lemons, uh, where bottom-up synthesis of these nanoribbons could provide a, uh, a route to wafer-scale nano, uh, nanoelectronics uh, based on graphene. So, so we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand the synthesis process of graphene, understanding what happens or how the substrate impacts it, how the step edges impact um, the, the, uh, the transport properties and the materials characteristics. And, and now we need to move into the graphene electronics. What, what can we do using epitaxial graphene uh, and, and how does it compare to, to everything else? So there's a few considerations that we have. Uh, the first is, is band gap engineering, because if we look at frequency response, so this is FT, uh, what we find is that we need to be able to potentially in, in, induce a band gap in this system because our output conductance is quite high. And this GD is, we'll just say that it's bad, um, uh, and it's inversely proportional to the frequency. So the higher it is, the worse our frequency response. 
we need high mobility. Uh, we also need to be able to uh, integrate top gate dielectrics with it. Uh, and we need to understand the device um, design and parasitics in this, these systems. So if we go through this process, like I, I'd shown the process before, and we make our final transistors, what do they look like? Well, this is a schematic um, of a gate metal high-K dielectric source strain at the petrographene. Uh, source strain is typically tie gold, um, uh, hafnium oxide, and then tie gold uh, gate. And again, I, as I mentioned before, we really have to do a good job of growing this material. But the next thing is we've got to do a good job of integrating it with dissimilar materials, metals and dielectrics. So the first thing is, is, is really how do we contact graphene, uh, make, make um, low resistance ohmic contacts to graphene. And the lowest reported resistances up to the point where we really started studying it were, were okay, but they weren't that great, uh, for, especially for high frequency uh, devices. We, we went through a, a standard process uh, where we use uh, polymers, uh, photoresist, to, to define where our ohmic contacts are going to go, and uh, then did a metal evaporation <coughs> lift off, and we're left with our metals and graphene in the middle. When we do that, what we find is that we get really terrible contact resistance. It's almost to the point where we can't get much current through the system, uh, through, the, through the graphene at all, which was, is, is really unheard of. Uh, so we took a step back, uh, or even at following annealing these samples, we could not get a very good contact resistance. Took a step back and said, okay, there's got to be something else going on here uh, because we're two orders of magnitude worse than anybody else. Uh, and, and, and we did a very careful study where uh, with, with XPS and spinning photoresist onto the graphene, stripping it off, and, and looking at the surface. And what we found is that graphene is like Velcro for photoresist, for this carbon junk, if you will. Uh, it was, it's very hard to get the photoresist off of graphene. And, and ultimately what we ended up having then is we would get, uh, when we'd go to define, we would end up getting this photoresist residue. Uh, so we now have a very low quality polymer layer in between our metal and our graphene, which is prohibiting us from getting true intimate contact with our graphene. So we introduced a, a low plasma power uh, etch, uh, oxygen plasma. So uh, we were able to remove that defective polymer uh, uh, surface or residual photoresist. And when we did that, we saw immediately a two order of magnitude improvement in our contact resistance without doing anything else other than just doing a very light ash. Uh, and it does, it can result in and defective uh, uh, graphene, but the, the interesting part is it's defective only under the contact, not in the channel itself. And the channel is where all of the, the good stuff happens for, for, for gating. If we then heat treat, we can get it down to um, uh, record levels uh, in, in terms from a device point of view, it's less than 100 ohm microns uh, for specific contact resistance. Uh, we're in the 10 to the minus eight ohm centimeter squared, uh, which is as low as the TLM uh, uh, process really can let us go and measure. So, so we, we, we think we have a good job, we, we've done a good job for integrating it with metals. The next step is really how do we integrate it with high K dielectrics? And this is where atomic layer deposition comes in. There's this cyclic process of precursor and water that comes in uh, to form layer by layer the, uh, the, the, the deposition of our high K dielectric. In this particular example, it's alumina. We actually used uh, half the a good bit. The problem with graphene is it's hydrophobic. So if you take a water-based process and put it in with uh, something that doesn't like water at all, clearly you're going to have to, uh, to really work at it to get them to, to be nice. <coughs> and unseated, so if we just take graphene and we put it in this AOD process, what we find is, is we get very non-uniform uh, systems or, or, or uh, growth of this dielectric on the graphene. On the other hand, if we what we refer to as seed, it can also be referred to as functionalization of the graphene, uh, the seed to surface, uh, we get very uniform coatings. So what we want to understand is um, what does this seeding process or what does the dielectric deposition and integration do uh, to the transport properties of graphene? Again, it all comes back to how are we impacting something that is only one to two atoms thick and can we uh, ensure that we can preserve the electronic properties of this material system? So this is a, a standard uh, system for the, uh, the, the oxide where we have a quote seed layer, functionalization layer, uh, as well as uh, then the ALD process. And we looked at two different methods 
uh, for, for the deposition. And, and those are just shown here. Uh, the specifics aren't that important other than when we use a high K dielectric that is directly in contact with the graphene, what we see is we get an improvement in, our, uh, in, the, in the properties of our epitaxial graphene, in the transport properties uh, of them. However, if we use a low K dielectric such as SiO2, we see a degradation in the, in the material properties uh, or in the electronic properties. And this really leads to uh, what's known as, uh, uh, the, the reasoning for this is dielectric screening. Because high K dielectrics do a much better job of screening charge impurities from the graphene than, than low K dielectrics do. So, so but what we really want then want to understand is, we, so we're, we're you know, working through these material um, issues with integrating with dielectrics, integrating with metals, how does it perform at the device level then? Uh, and, uh, how does quasi, this quasi-free standing epitaxial graphene, so how does then uh, the, this removal of the buffer layer, if you will, impact the properties of, of our, our transistors? And what we find is if we take our as-drone epitaxial graphene, we have a transconductance versus saturation current. These are two figures of merit in, in electrical engineering. Uh, and uh, the higher the better, we went up in this corner. Uh, as-drone, we get you know, moderate performance. Um, and once we remove this buffer layer, we say, okay, we've done now broken all these bonds here, passivated with hydrogen. We get a two to 300 increase in, in all of the properties. So now we have transistors that are becoming competitive with current state of the art um, in this. And it's all because we've been able to tailor this interface between the graphene and the silicon carbide. If you take a look at uh, scaling the devices, so these are just some SEMs of, of the, the, uh, the source training gate um, for RF devices. You can see that the frequency of operation, or our current gain cutoff, versus gate length intrinsically uh, follows to the point where we can, we can get better than 130 gigahertz in, in performance on these systems. Uh, uh, and, and this is just the, uh, the data for that. This data, though, that, that's being plotted here is when we take out all the bad things about the, the transistors that we've defined. Uh, and the extrinsic performance actually is quite poor. So we want to understand why is this the case. And as it turns out, if you look at the Dirac point, you see that there's, there's a significant amount of degradation in the, in the properties. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll scoot through this quickly. Um, but if you take a look at, at the way the electronic properties of these are, Right under the contacts, this, it's P plus, uh, so you're doping the contacts. And, and in the middle of the channel, so there's graphene right here, uh, you get intrinsic uh, graphene. So that means that uh, this, is, this is pristine graphene. You get spillover of charge into the channel. That's fine for long channels, so when they're very far apart. But when you start to go narrow, you get significant doping, and you get this shift to the direct point. Um, in addition to that, we get a, a uh, gated region that we can make a, a, a PNP junction uh, and that branch, that, that quenches our end branch. So we moved to nanoribbons. Uh, and by, doing, by moving to nanoribbons, what we found is every single one of our properties inc improved. Uh, and what we want to understand is why is this the case? Uh, well, of course, you look at the literature, nanoribbons equal band gap. That's awesome. Uh, the nanoribbons we're using are 50 nanometers, uh, so that is an estimated 8 milli electron volts uh, of a band gap. Um, is that good enough? You again take a look at the literature and, and, and it tells you that even at a 13 nanometer ribbon where we're 100 milli electron volts, room temperature we only have an on-off ratio of 8. That's exactly what we have with our, our 50 nanometer ribbons. So we know that it's not good enough. So it comes down to that uh, if, we, if you then model the system, where we have a nanoribbon dielectric and a gate, uh, we're significantly enhancing our electric field around that nanoribbon. And that's providing us with this additional control over the modulation. So it's not just the basic material properties that we're finding um, that, that could, that for the band gap, but it's more of the electrostatics as well uh, in this system. So, that, so the, the, the biggest thing is, can we beat state of the art? Digital electronics, uh, probably not in its current form. Analog electronics, it looks very promising. Um, and and, and it's, these analog electronics are very important in, in communications. 
frequency is, is a big deal. So the cutoff frequency versus gate length. And what we're finding is uh, the pink area here, graphene, uh, in its current state, experimentally, has been able to put up, keep up with all of the state of the art. And uh, there's some recent work that showed projected graphene to be able to work in the terahertz, which is very impressive uh, at much longer gate lengths than, than most others. Graphene is, is more linear uh, than in the, 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 the device performance. Uh, and then if you then take, take these graphene data points and you plot them just amongst themselves, looking at cutoff frequency versus gate length, what you find is at the top of everything is epitaxial graphene in all cases, regardless of gate length. So this is, this is uh, an important um, part of this, and this is why uh, we, we find graphene as a, a wonder material. So in, in, in summary, um, you know, hopefully what I've, I've done is, is uh, educate you a little bit on epitaxial graphene and uh, that epitaxial graphene is, is truly a nanoscale material system, very well suited for device and, and, and graphene electronics. So before opening for questions, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, past and present collaborators in graphene in general, not just epitaxial graphene, uh, as well as some very important people that, that have helped to make this successful in, in our funding. So with that, I'll take questions.